good morning, Santa Barbara. Let me tell you something. He is risen. That's right. I love you who said he's risen indeed. Because let me tell you something, people, that for 2,000 years, that's how Christians have been greeting one another on this glorious Easter morning. One would come up to another, and one would say, he is risen. And the other one would reply, he's risen indeed, because Christians love Easter. It's the time when the resurrection of Jesus is celebrated at its fullest. So let's do it one more time, right? He is risen. He is risen now, I just wish that we had some kind of symbol in our midst that could tell us that he's risen. <laughs> Friends, you see it all over the place, don't you? These arrows, these markers that remind us of the fact that Jesus of Nazareth is risen from the dead. And it's something that we could talk about in a lot of different aspects here this morning. We could talk about it in the sense of trying to prove you of its historical reliability. And let me tell you, that's just sort of a message I'm itching to tell you about, but I'm not going to do it this morning because I feel like I've got bigger fish to fry. Oh, it's a helpful thing, and I'd be welcome to talk to anybody afterwards if you want some proof, if you want some evidence, if you want some confidence that the resurrection of Jesus was not just a fable, was not just the figment of somebody's imagination, or a nice story that well-meaning people tell one to another, but it's historical fact it really happened, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. But more so this morning, I want to celebrate it. I want to proclaim it. I want to enjoy the truth that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Now, friends, every day it's true. Every day is sort of like a brand new Easter morning for those who are followers of Jesus Christ. Every day it's true that Jesus is risen from the dead, that he lives and he loves for today. But I will tell you this, some days it just seems more special than others. And today is just one of those days, isn't it? Look at the beautiful surroundings. Look at the shining sun that God has given us. Today is a day of sunshine. It's a day of new life. It's a day when literally more than a billion followers of Jesus Christ all over the planet get happy and remember the day when the resurrection of Jesus Christ was revealed to the world. It happened on the Sunday after he was crucified. Now let me read to you a couple of verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where the Apostle Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, tells us how important it is that Jesus rose from the dead. He says here in verse 14 that if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. And then he says later on in verse 17, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Now, friends, I believe that with all my heart. I believe that if Jesus is in fact risen, it changes everything. And I believe that if it isn't, if it's not true that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, then this preaching is empty, then you're still in your sins, that our faith is futile. But friends, I'm here to proclaim to you very happily so, that it is true, that it happened in time, in space, in history. Now, I'll admit, nobody saw it happen. Did you ever think about that? That nobody actually saw the moment when life came back into the lifeless body of Jesus after he was crucified on the cross and prepared for burial and laid in that tomb. He was buried in a tomb, but now, as you see the symbols all around you reminding you, he is risen. And even though nobody saw it happen, nobody missed the truth of it. His friends knew it, right? Because they appeared to him and he comforted them, both the women who first witnessed the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, can I just say, ladies, that's to your everlasting glory and credit that Jesus Christ gave you the privilege of being the first ones to see the resurrected Jesus. But it wasn't only the women who saw it. It was also his disciples. It wasn't only his friends that knew that Jesus was risen from the dead, but even his opponent, even his enemies knew it, and they knew that it was true, that it wasn't a story, that it's not a fable, that it's not make-believe, that it really happened. And because of that, Jesus of Nazareth is the most influential, compelling person of all of history. Now, I say that without shame. I say that without any reservation at all. And if anybody would dispute it, I'd welcome you to come up and speak to me personally. I'd love to dispute that with somebody. I'd love for you to name them. Oh, I know there's been other great uh, religious leaders who have amassed quite a following, both in the ancient world and in the modern world. 
but I don't know anybody who's had the effect on human civilization that Jesus of Nazareth has had. He's the most compelling person of all history. Now, in the time that I have to speak with you here this morning, I want to tell you the story of Easter, the story of Jesus' resurrection. And I want to tell you that story by speaking about four gardens that are mentioned in the Bible. Again, four gardens that are mentioned in the Bible. Now, if you want to know how we're tracking along in the sermon, because I'll be friends with you. There's some people here, you're sort of wondering, when's this going to end? When's this man going to stop talking? Well, you can just clock it along with me step by step, right? Four gardens. And when I get to number four, you know I'm pretty close to the end. All right. What's the first garden that I want to speak to you about that's mentioned in the Bible? Well, probably many of you, it comes into your mind already, right? You know it, don't you? The Garden of Eden. This is what it says in Genesis chapter 2 at verse 8. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. That's verse 8 of Genesis chapter 2. Now here's verse 15 of Genesis chapter 2. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. The Bible tells us, Jesus later confirmed it, that there actually was a garden of Eden and an Adam and Eve. Now, I realize that as I say those words, there might be some here this morning, and you doubt that. You think that that's just some archaic story meant to explain uh, the, the fallen condition of man or some uh, ancient legend that's been written down by old people and is now popularly believed. And friends, I, I don't really want to debate the fact whether or not you believe that what actually the Bible describes is the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve, whether or not it really happened. That's a debate that people could have another time. But I would just challenge you with this thought. Something happened. Don't you think? Can't you open up the newspaper and say something's happened to humanity? Can't you turn on the television news and see right in your face the fallen condition of man? But listen, for many of you, you don't have to open up the newspaper. You can open up a history book, right? You can look at the horrific record of genocides, the horrific record of cruelty and mistreatment and how people have hated one another and cursed one another and fought against one another. Sometimes in the most irrational blood feuds that have lasted from generation to generation, you realize that something's happened. But there's others of you. You don't have to look in a newspaper. You don't have to turn on the television news. You don't even have to look in a history book. You know where you can find out that something's wrong? You look in the mirror, right? Let's be honest about this, right? We look at our own lives and we realize that we're not all that we should be. Oh, listen, I know I'm addressing a lot of fine people, and I don't mean to demean you, but you know yourself that you've fallen short of God's standard for your life. If you don't understand that, then just ask God about it. Ask him that question. He'll let you know. Ladies and gentlemen, even if you don't believe the Garden of Eden account as it's written in the book of Genesis, surely you would have to agree with me that something happened in that first garden. That we live in a fallen world, and when the world fell, it fell hard. Don't you believe that? And we could wish that things might have gotten better after that initial sin in the Garden of Eden. Do you remember what the Bible describes it as being? The Bible tells us that Adam and Eve sinned in what we would consider to be a relatively small thing, right? God told them not to eat of the fruit of a specific tree. And they went ahead and in crass rebellion against God, they said, no, we're going to do exactly different from what you've told us to do. And they disobeyed God flagrantly, right to his face. Now, friends, you might consider that to be a small thing, and I suppose relatively when we compare it to the great tragedies throughout human history, it is a small thing. But I will tell you this, that it got worse and worse very quickly after that. You know the second major sin that the Bible describes for us? It's not the sin of just taking a piece of fruit off a tree that God told you not to. The second great sin that's described in the Bible is when a man murdered his own brother. Friend, that's falling fast. That's falling hard, and the human race has fallen and come back down further and further ever since. Now, we could wish that things would have gotten better after that, 
But I got to say, sometimes I look at the world around us, and I'm grateful for modern technology. I'm grateful for the world we live in today. But sometimes it thinks that, that God has just uh, put us in a world where man, in rebellion to God, devises more and more sophisticated ways to sin. Now, God promised Adam that in the day he ate of that forbidden fruit, he would die. And let me tell you something, folks. Adam did die that day. He began to die with a clock ticking down just like each one of us. You and I have a figure of speech. Sometimes we say that we're in the land of the living. But I want you to consider that in a sense that's false. We're not in the land of the living. We're in the land of the dying. Look at any graveyard. Uh, look at any hospital. Look at any hospice care. Ladies and gentlemen, every one of us has an expiration date written on our life. Do we not? Every one of us is going to have to reckon with a day when we will no longer breathe on this earth and we'll pass from one life unto the next. Death is appointed for each one of us and it was introduced into the world when Adam and Eve so flagrantly sinned in the Garden of Eden. You could say this, that there was a battle that was fought in that garden. There was a battle that was fought in the Garden of Eden and the battle was against death. And you know what, guess what the bad news is? Adam died. He lost that battle. All right, that's the first garden. What's our second garden? The second garden is a garden that the Bible describes for us fast forwarding many thousands of years into the time of Jesus. The Bible tells us that Jesus, on the night before he was crucified, went to a garden called the Garden of Gethsemane. You see, in the first garden, Adam started out as a sinless man, but he didn't stay that way. Many years later, there was a second sinless man, Jesus of Nazareth. And you know the story of Jesus of Nazareth, don't you? I say that to a crowd like this, and I imagine that most of you do, but I can't help but think, but there's many people who don't. You've never really heard the story. You've never really heard the story that he was miraculously conceived and born of a virgin, whom we call the Virgin Mary. You may not really be known, uh, be aware that he lived a fairly anonymous life for 30 years, working as a carpenter until he began the great work of his life. You, you may not really know that he was a preacher, a teacher, and a man who worked great miracles. And I say those words, and even as I say preacher, even as I say teacher, even as I say a man who worked great miracles, I say those words and I instantly realize that's not nearly saying enough. Not nearly at all. A preacher? He was an incredible preacher. Have you ever read the Sermon on the Mount? Have you ever read how that distills all the best wisdom of human research and psychology and counseling and insight and how a man or a woman should live before God in this world? And if you could condense it all down in the most succinct statement, you'd come up with something vaguely resembling the Sermon on the Mount. You ever read the wisdom of Jesus as he teaches, as he instructs, as he teaches about who God is, how who man is, and who he himself is? Oh, he was a preacher, he was a teacher, but let me tell you, he was a worker of miracles. That man, that man, Jesus, he healed people who were completely filled with leprosy. Jesus was a man who stood before a raging storm on the Sea of Galilee, and he spoke to that storm, and it was instantly calmed. Here's a man who went to a, 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 a religious leader whose young daughter had died and he raised her from the dead. Here's a man who fed multitudes by multiplying loaves and fishes in his very hands. I could go on and on and on, but he was a preacher. He was a teacher. He was a man who worked great miracles, but he was also a man who challenged the religious establishment of his day. That he did without apology. That he did with full strength and with full power. And because he challenged the religious establishment the way that he did, the religious establishment eventually wanted to kill Jesus. And after three years of his earthly work, they were ready to trap Jesus and to execute him, but not before he entered that second garden, right? First garden, the Garden of Eden. Second garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. The Bible tells us these words in John chapter 18, verse 1. It says this, that when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, and there was a garden where he and his disciples entered. 
You see, at the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus spent an agonized night in prayer before he was arrested, before he was crucified. You could say this, that the Garden of Gethsemane was a place of decision. Jesus there decided, he decided finally, he decided completely that he would go the way of the cross, that cruel instrument of execution. And when we think about the suffering that Jesus endured on the cross, when we think about the scourging with the whip that he endured before he went there, when he endured the, the, uh, the extreme trial of carrying the cross to the place of execution, as he laid down upon that beam and had his hands nailed to it, we can think about it and emphasize the blood, and there was a lot of blood. We could emphasize the gore, and friends, it was gory. We could emphasize the suffering that afflicted Jesus, and all of those would be legitimate things for us to talk about and for us to consider. But you know what I really want you to consider about the cross? Because as much as the cross speaks to us about blood, as much as it speaks to us about gore, as much as it speaks to us about the suffering of an innocent man, ladies and gentlemen, the cross speaks to us about love. He was up there because he loves us. He was up there because he chose to be. Oh, he could escape. He could avoid it. He could have got himself out of that mess. All the power was in Jesus' hands. Nevertheless, he believed with all of his heart that it was important for him to do this. Why? Because he loves humanity. He loves each one of us. I know some people hear about the love of God for them, and they instantly either put their brain on pause because they feel like they've heard it a thousand times before, or they wonder what it's all about. They wonder, how can he love me when I don't love him all that much? Let me tell you something. He loves you because he made you. He loves you because he created you in his image. You have the image of God stamped upon you. He loves you because he looks after you, and he's been looking after you your entire life. Now the battle fought in the Garden of Gethsemane, that place where Jesus made the decision that he would follow through on the plan of the cross, that place where he said there is absolutely no turning back, that was a battle against everything that separates us from God. And Jesus gave up his life in that battle. You know, when people battle, there's often death, is there not? When people fight in a battle, there was death in the Garden of Gethsemane, and there was death in the Garden of Eden. But the death in the Garden of Gethsemane was a deliberate death, a decision to lay down one's life and to do it for you because he loves you, because he cares for you so greatly. Friends, that's the second guard. So what do we have so far? The Garden of Eden, the Garden of Gethsemane. What's our third garden? It's the Garden of the Tomb. Now, I don't even know if you know this. This might come to news to many of you. But Jesus rose from the dead in a garden. Did you know that? You see, that's where he was buried. That's where the power of his resurrection was first displayed, in a garden. Let me read to you from John chapter 19, verses 41 and 42. Ready for this? Listen carefully. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had been laid. So there they laid the body of Jesus. You can picture it, can't you? There's Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea coming and laying the wrapped up prepared body of Jesus. It had been taken down from the cross and put inside that tomb. And it was a brand new tomb. Nobody had ever been set in that tomb before. And then three days later on Sunday morning, it was first discovered when the women came to the tomb and they saw an amazing scene. They saw that the door of that tomb was blown wide open. You see, because it wasn't actually a door, there was a stone that was rolled in front of the doorway of that tomb, as was the custom of that time. And they saw that that stone was rolled away. They saw that there was an angel sitting upon that stone. And they saw that the Roman soldiers who were given the responsibility to guard that tomb against any possible theft, those Roman soldiers were cowering in fear because the power of the resurrected Jesus was greater than the power of Rome, it was greater than the power of death, and it was certainly greater than the power of sin. It amazed the disciples. 
And friends, this is what they saw. They saw an empty tomb and a risen Savior. Now, just a few weeks ago, I got back from a trip to Israel, and I went to Jerusalem, and I saw the places. And let me tell you something, folks. That tomb is still empty. You can go look for it for yourself. Jesus is not there. He is risen. He's risen from the dead. And that makes the difference for everything. It shows that he conquered over sin. It shows that he conquered over death. He served notice to them both. Let me tell you, this is how it works. Jesus wins. Sin and death, you lose. He is the triumphant Savior over both of those. You see, because the resurrection means that Jesus is who he said he was. He said that he was the only way to God. The resurrection means that's true. Jesus said that he was the mediator between God and man. The resurrection means that's true. Jesus said that the way to eternal life was to put your trust in him. And the resurrection means that that statement of Jesus is true. The resurrection also means that Jesus said he could do things and he can actually do them. The, the resurrection is the validity for that. It proves that he can do what he actually said he could do. Now, do you know that Jesus said he could forgive your sins? Did you know that Jesus said that he could give you new life? The resurrection means that it's true. The resurrection means that Jesus lives today. He's not a dead Savior. He's a living Savior who comes to live in and among his people. Friends, if there was a battle fought in the Garden of Eden, and I believe there was, if there was a battle fought in the Garden of Gethsemane, and I believe there was, there was a battle fought in the Garden of the Tomb, and that battle was against death. And you know what? Death was defeated. It's gone. It's a defeated enemy. And some people think a man rising from the dead never to die again? That can't happen. It's impossible. Let me tell you something. The Bible tells us that it was impossible for it not to happen. He had to rise. As you read right in front of you, the grave could not hold him, right? Jesus could never stay buried in that garden tomb. He rose out of that garden with new life. You see, the grave couldn't hold him because he didn't sin like Adam sinned. When Adam was in a garden of decision, Adam chose badly, and it affected the whole human race after that. When Jesus was in his garden of decision, he chose right, and everything is affected for those who put their trust in him. The grave couldn't hold him because he won that battle in the Garden of Gethsemane. Friends, that's our third garden, the Garden of the Tomb. So what do we got so far? The Garden of Eden, the Garden of Gethsemane, and the third one, the Garden of the Tomb. What's our fourth garden? Have you figured it out yet? The fourth garden that's mentioned in the Bible? Friends, you're sitting in it right now, the sunken gardens of Santa Barbara. No, absolutely. This right here, right now, this is the fourth garden. And you might be surprised to hear that the Bible mentions these sunken gardens. But I believe that it does, and I believe it with all my heart. Because the Bible speaks of the present moment. The Bible speaks of the time right here, right now, when men and women are confronted with who Jesus is and what he came to do with their life. And friends, since you are here, right here, right now in the sunken gardens, the Bible talks about this very same place. You see, the message of who Jesus is and what he did for us on the cross comes to you today, and this is a place of decision for you. Those previous three gardens, Eden, Gethsemane, the Garden of the Tomb, those things happened in history, and history meets you right here, right now in these sunken gardens. Today, today is a day of grace. Today is a day of power. Today is a day of hope. But it's also a day of decision. You are in a garden of decision right now. That makes it a battleground. You hear the chimes off in the distance, right? Doesn't that remind you? Doesn't it remind you that this is a momentous occasion? This is a time of decision. This is something that you should give attention to because there's a battle being fought here today, and it is a true spiritual battle. It's not a battle or a fight against people. 
It's not like one side of the sunken gardens is going to run off and start fighting the other side of the sunken gardens. I'm very happy about that this morning. But no, it's not a fight against people, but it's a fight for people. It's a fight for their past. It's a fight for their present. It's a fight for their future. Now, some people, when they hear the term spiritual battle, they don't know what we're talking about. But let me tell you something, friend. To say something is spiritual doesn't mean that it's unreal. The spiritual is real. And too many people think that spiritual is disconnected from reality. But let me tell you the truth. You know very well in your soul that if something is spiritual, it's real. And Jesus Christ came to do this for you. Jesus Christ came to pay the penalty for your sins. He rose from the dead to give you new life. That forgiveness, that new life is here for you today. This new life is a life of forgiveness. Do, do you realize how great, how liberating it is for you to be free from the guilt of your sin? What are you saying? That you've never felt guilt? Are you saying that your soul has never been burdened by that? Really? Now please, look inside yourself. Look carefully for yourself. You know that you need that forgiveness. You know that you need hope. You know that you need His grace. You know that you need His peace. That new life is Jesus Himself living in you and through you. Now look, friends, in just a few moments, our music team is coming back. And when they do, I'm going to ask you to make a decision and to proclaim your decision by coming up front to your, from your seat and walking up with others to this front area of the sunken gardens. And as we're gathered here this morning, I know there's many people here. You've never made a decision for Jesus Christ. You've never put your faith in Him. You've never said, Jesus, I believe in who you are and what you came to do. You've never said, Jesus, I repent. Would you forgive me for my sins? There's people here. You haven't done that yet, but today is your day to do it. Others of you here, you may have done that sometime in the distant past, but to be honest, you've fallen so far from that place that today is the day for you to do it all over again. So I want you to prepare yourself. When you have the opportunity to make this decision, do it. Because opportunities like this don't come every day. Every day is not Easter Sunday with this time, with these welcoming, loving people, with people who are caring for you and praying for you and inviting for you to do what is right before God and man. And the key to it all is faith. Putting your trust in who Jesus is and what he did for you at the cross. Now, friends, please understand me. Faith does not mean that you understand everything. Faith does not mean that you never have a doubt. Faith does not mean that all the struggles end. But faith means that you choose to look away from yourself and to put your trust in who Jesus is and what he did for you on the cross. It means this. You stop trying to save yourself, and you let him save you by what he did for you. Let me explain it to you this way. You are coming from one garden, the Garden of Eden, the place of fallenness and separation. You are coming through another garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, the place where the penalty was paid and where our sins were credited to Jesus' account and he received that judgment in our place. And you are coming to the third garden, the garden tomb, the place of new life, and it's all happening for you right here at the fourth garden, the sunken gardens of April 8th, 2012. Today is your day. Now is your time. Yesterday I spoke with a man who just a few years ago, he saw a woman and her daughter come forward to receive new life in Jesus Christ. And he told me that he later found out that the woman's husband also came along. She didn't even know that the husband was coming. But once the woman and the daughter were up there, the husband came up behind them and put his hand on the woman's shoulder. And there was husband and wife and daughter all together to find new life in Jesus Christ. A precious moment, right? Well, the wife was surprised. She turned back and she looked at her husband who... 
I don't know how to say it delicately, he was an unlikely candidate to come forward at such a thing as this, right? And so she was surprised to see him. And what did she say? She asked him the question, well, why are you here? What are you doing here? And you know what he said? He said these words, I didn't want to be left behind. Friends, you don't want to be left behind. Jesus Christ is reaching out to you today with new life, with the power of the resurrection, with forgiveness of sins. New life is here for you right now in the Garden of Decision. And I'm going to pray that many today make the right decision. I'm gonna...